This is a video lesson on arrows used in chemistry. We use many arrows for many different purposes, and this will help you with getting familiar with their use. Their first type of arrow is the forward arrow. You are familiar with this. As you can see, the reactants are written on the left and the products are written on the right of the arrow. This is a chemical equation and is normally balanced. This video continues with notes from Ogilvy's mechanistic pattern. In section 7.4, this is about over the arrow notation and how to interpret the reaction. Over the arrow notation is used very frequently in organic chemistry and this is a compact or space saving method to give information about the reaction conditions which are written over or under the reaction arrow. For example, in this reaction, reactants are written on the left as normal and products are on the right of the arrow. Notice that the solvent, THF, tetrahydrofuran, and temperature conditions are written above and below the arrow respectively. In the second example, the main functional group is written to the left of the arrow because it is the organic molecule that will be the focus of the chemical transformation and the reagents and other conditions are written above and below the arrow. This is called over the arrow notation. There is no general rule on what goes above or below, but I consistently write the reagents above and the solvent temperature below. Notice in the second example, the full reagent identity is included with over the arrow notation. In writing sequential reactions where there are two or more reactions, this can be written as separate reaction equations as shown here. In this example, the first reaction must be completed before the second is carried out. Water cannot be added to the first reaction as it will react violently with lithium aluminum hydride. The second reaction is called a base hydrolysis reaction and converts the intermediate product to an alcohol. These two reactions can be written as a more compact sequence. The first option is where the product of the first reaction is the reactant in the second reaction. In the color-coded scheme, the first reaction is highlighted in pink and the second reaction is in blue. It is understood that the first reaction must be completed before the second one is performed. Option number two. This is the most compact representation of sequential reactions. The main organic functional group is the sole reactant on the left. The reaction order sequence is written with the reagents and conditions above and below the arrow that are used to transform the reactant into the desired product. Note, in this representation, two sequential reactions are implied by using a single reaction arrow. Also, notice that the side products are not included. For other sequential reactions, there could be more than two sequential reactions and only one reaction arrow is still used. The three consecutive arrows, either one after another or stacked, represent a question of multi-step reactions from a specific starting functional group and other reactants. You are expected to give the reagents and products for each step of the pathway to transform the starting reactant into the desired organic product. This may involve some simple side reactions to give a desired reactant for one or more steps. Number two, the equilibrium arrow. This shows that the reaction is reversible and the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction are equal. There is no net change in the concentration of the reactants or the products but there continues to be a dynamic exchange of species. Remember that a change in concentration, temperature, or pressure causes a stress that is relieved by shifting the reaction to produce more products or favor the reactants to re-establish equilibrium according to Le Chatelier's principle. So, which equilibrium arrow do you use? It really doesn't matter because in 1884, Jacobus von Hoff introduced the opposite pointing straight arrows with full arrowheads 
This was replaced by Marshall in 1902 with opposite pointing straight arrows with singly barbed arrowheads. These singly barbed arrowheads for equilibrium should not be confused with the curved arrows that are singly barbed for radical single electron reaction mechanisms. Here are some examples of the use of equilibrium arrows. In acid-base chemistry, these reactions exist in equilibrium and since chemists know the relative strength of acids, we know which side of the equilibrium is favored and we can use non-equal size arrows that favor one side of the reaction over the other. So for example, hydrofluoric acid is a stronger acid than hydrocyanic acid. The equilibrium favors the product side as seen by the longer arrow pointing right and a shorter arrow pointing left. Conversely, if the reaction is written with the hydrocyanic acid and the fluoride ion as the reactants, the equilibrium arrow favors the reactant side. The meaning of this is that very little product is formed. The other example is conformational stability. This is in chapter 3 of Ogilvy's mechanistic pattern and as you can see the equilibrium favors the conformer that is more stable. Having the methyl group in the axial position increases the energy of the molecule due to steric interactions between the large methyl group and the hydrogens that are axial. This is called a 1-3 diaxial interaction. It's a steric interaction that destabilizes the molecule. More detail will be offered in a video on conformers. The reverse reaction can also be written and now the equilibrium arrow favors the reactant or the left side. Number three dipole moment arrow. This is often referred to as a vector arrow. The arrow has a full arrow head and a perpendicular line close to the tail end. This is an arrow that is placed parallel to a bond between two atoms that are different and points at the more electronegative atom to show the direction of electron density. In this example of carbon dioxide, the arrows are pointing opposite with equal magnitude. The net sum of these vector arrows is that they cancel and there is no net dipole moment. And so carbon dioxide is a non-polar molecule. Number four, the precipitation arrow. In solution, when a precipitate is produced, it falls down to the bottom, hence the downward pointing arrow. This arrow is used in the balanced chemical equation that replaces the S for solid. Note, both S and the arrow are not written together. Also note that when physical states are indicated, there is no need for the arrow. Number five, the gas evolution arrow. When gas is evolved in a reaction, the gas produced is less dense than air and it floats up, hence the upward pointing arrow. This symbol replaces G for gas. If physical states are indicated, then there is no need for this arrow. Number six, this is the electron occupancy arrow that represents the electron spin angular momentum, either pointing along the direction of a magnetic field or opposed to the magnetic field. In each orbital, there can exist two electrons with opposite spins. For carbon that has six electrons, the electron configuration is given here. Only the 2p orbital is not paired and it follows Hund's rule because the p orbitals are degenerate or equal energy. Arrows in orbitals can also be used to show the covalent bonding electrons between valence orbitals. In this diagram, this is an example of covalent bonding in ethene. On the left is the sigma framework where this involves only the sigma bonding electrons that lie along the internuclear axis. For example, the carbon to carbon bond is the result of an sp2 carbon to sp2 carbon orbital overlap and each of these orbitals contribute one electron to form the bond. The pi framework is shown in color orange and blue. This is the overlap of p orbitals that are above and below the internuclear axis to give the pi bond.